Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Mum. Good afternoon. Uh, could everyone who's taking part again put their cameras on, please? Marvellous, thank you. Um, Carmel, can I just check whether we have anybody new observing or whether it's just uh, the people who've been observing throughout? It's the same people as this morning. OK, well, thank well, you. There's no one different. OK, thank you. So I don't need to, to do introductions again or anything like that. Thank you. Well, welcome to the afternoon session um, of the hearings for the second day. Um, we are going to move on now to uh, discussing the wider statement of common ground, uh, triggers and timing of submission of a replacement local plan that's covered in question 6, uh, 6A and 6B. Um, it will also cover question uh, and 6C will also cover question 7 as well as to any other plans um, which have the potential to impact uh, on matters being discussed. It would be very helpful for me to turn first to the um, statement of common ground on the comparison of triggers used in recent local plans in Leicestershire. Uh, it has been uh, agreed uh, between North West Leicestershire and uh, some of the other participants. Does that, has everybody else seen a copy of it who hasn't uh, been involved in the drawing up of the agreement. OK, thank you. I'll come to Mr Nelson, I think, first to, to explain the, the reason for, for submitting the Statement of Common Ground and what you hoped would happen uh, as, a, as a result of it. Um, I think it would be useful to discuss that or at least give me a summary anyway. Yes, yes, thank you, uh, Madam. Um, the purpose behind it was when I was reading the various representations uh, that made uh, comments about uh, other local plans in Leicestershire which had triggers in, um, I must admit I was getting confused. Uh, uh, and obviously I know Leicestershire probably better than, than most people. Uh, so it just seemed to make sense to try and pull something together to uh, sort of summarise as easily as possible what those different uh, policies in those different local plans were saying, try to pick out some of the common factors or, or not common factors, uh, just as a, a, a means really to aid discussion today. Um, that was that was the simple purpose uh, behind it. You do um, OK, uh, sorry, carry on. No, carry on. No, if you hadn't finished, I just heard somebody in the background. So I wasn't yeah, sure. No, likewise. Um, yeah, so I mean, obviously uh, what we've put forward in terms of a change to policy one does in include one trigger, which is the uh, wider statement of common ground. Um, if you look at some of the other local plans in Leicestershire, they, they do include other triggers. But as noted in the statement of common ground, those triggers are always about uh, starting a review. Obviously, that is a process which we know from this morning that we are already fully engaged in anyway. Um, our trigger is is a trigger after which the plan has to be submitted. OK. Um, and some, I, I, having looked at this, some also have triggers, I suppose, following um, following that as well, don't they? I just want to clear up a, a, a basic question, I suppose. Um, a couple of the, the policies mention a statement of common ground and a couple mention memorandum of understanding. And I think one mentions both. So I, I, it would just be helpful to understand from your perspective, if you're, if you're able to, Mr Nelson, what, what the difference is, uh, if there is a difference. My understanding is that there isn't a difference. I think it's just a case of uh, terminology changes through time. So if we go back to when the headner was being produced and even before that, actually, uh, memorandum of understandings were, were, were agreed by the local authorities. Obviously, now the government has uh, sort of formalised some of the duty to cooperate cooperate arrangements a little bit more uh, and refers to statements of common ground. So. 
my view would be that they are one and the same thing. Um, I notice Mr Thornhill is is uh, present today and he was at uh, the heart. He was at Harbour at the time that they had their examination. So I don't know whether he he would agree with that view because I think the Harbour plan does talk about both on memory. Uh, yes, yeah, I would, and then I'll come to you, Mr. Bamford. Um, yeah, so, so, so yeah, Ian, uh, Ian's uh, summary there is, is fair. I think the reason why it refers to both uh, at Harbour was I think when the policy was originally drafted, it probably referred to memorandum of understanding. Then um, the new MPPF was published, and although it was tested against the the old MPPF, it was just to to update the terminology to cover all bases, basically. So it's a, it's a terminology point of view that the, the general substance of them was intended to be the same. OK, thank you. Uh, Mr Bamford, uh, would you like to say something? And I know you're one of the parties that signed the agreement, aren't you? Uh, we, we are, Mum, yes. Um, it's, it's more just to concur with what both Mr Nelson and Mr Thornhill said. I've had the pleasure to be at all of those local plan examinations. Um, all took um, kind of place in different points in time and it is simply um, where we were at that particular point in time which terminology was used in the uh, in the particular uh, trigger mechanism. So if if you were um, looking at uh, one of these particular policies are, are any of you suggesting that one is more relevant than the other, perhaps to Northwest Leicester shares, or is there anything contained within uh, parts of these policies that you think would be relevant? Just to, just to help out. Otherwise, I, I suppose there's still a, 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 a kind of pick and mix choice, isn't there? I think I think for our, our purposes, Mom, it is a pick and mix. Um, at exercise uh, obviously I think Northwest Leicester, Leicestershire were the first through this particular process and that's probably led uh, partly to the wording that was included in that uh, in that policy not being quite um, uh, appropriate um, for, for now certainly um, I think as we went through those processes we tweaked that wording um, and uh, I think it's we're, we're now moved on considerably from that that point again uh, and I think it is a pick and mix process to get the best of those um, trigger policies into um, the, whatever the trigger policy is for, for North West Leicestershire. I think the concern from our point of view has, has always revolved around um, both time frame um, and some kind of backstop stroke fail safe um, should progress not or, or sufficient progress not be made. And I think that's that's the critical element of, of getting this trigger mechanism right for, for North West Lests. OK, thank you. Uh, did anybody else who wanted to come out? I, I will come back to you, Mr Richards, in a minute. Uh, anybody else who signed up to the statement of common ground for the triggers want to add anything? Uh, Mr Fox? Yes, thank you, Mark. We were involved in, um, in drafting the, and agreeing the statement as well. Um, I was just going to mention I think from our perspective, we think the statement of common ground approach, the trigger to that is, is absolutely fine. But I think if you look at things like Obi and Wigston and also Harborough, they do have backstop dates built in. So they have an additional backstop date in addition to the memorandum or the statement of common ground. And I think both of those are, they both equate to 30 months when you add up the two triggers. So I think from our perspective, we, we'd welcome some form of backstop being built into the into the policy. Okay. I still um, make, sorry, sorry, man. One other point as well is that having looked at the wording of the of the revised policy, the draft policy, um, it's referring to Leicester City's unmet needs specifically in the second second element of the of the paragraph. Whereas if you look at um, Melton and Obi and Wigston, they're both referring to sort of general unmet needs across the HMA and I think given what we discussed this morning whereby there's a, there's a potential that Leicester may be able to meet its own needs under any new standard method but there could be unmet needs elsewhere in the HMA I think that's just something which should be um, should be allowed for in the policy rather than being definitive 
and specific just to Leicester City. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I'll come back to Mr Nelson on that point, but I will hear from the others. So just bear with me while I can I can't see everybody on the screen at the moment. So I'm just checking uh, who's raised their hand. As that Mr Richards, I will come back to you. Um, uh, Miss Green. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Um, yes, we're, we're also um, one of the parties who was involved in um, putting together this statement of common ground. Um, I mean, we feel that it's um, it's sort of a, a factual statement. Um, and I think that um, the table um, shows how this type of policy in the Leicestershire HMA area has sort of evolved over time as we've gone through numerous examinations of, of local plans. Um, and I, I, I agree with Mr. Mr. Bamford that, um, that, it, that the approach probably is a bit of a pick and mix. Um, but what I felt that the, um, the statement of common ground and the table enabled us to do is, is almost to move the, um, the discussion along by sort of saying, well, if you had a final column, you know, what would you be putting into that final column with regards to each of the each of the lines? So I felt that it was that it was a useful document to have produced to help us to sort of move forward on on what kind of um, triggers um, we think should be in there. Um, and um, we, we share the concern of, of most of the participants that um, we don't want. We feel that as as the policy is currently drafted, um, it, it is just too too open ended, um, and it could it, it might never come to a resolution. So we were also seeking um, to have some more, to try and put in a little bit more certainty, um, but equally with sufficient flexibility there, so that um, as Mr. Fox has mentioned at the moment. The re there is reference just to unmet needs from Leicester, um, but looking forward and building on the discussion that we were having this, this morning, it may be that in actual fact, other unmet needs evolve if we move to the new standard methodology, etc. So we need to have some flexibility in there, as well as trying to create some more certainty as, as to timescales. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, it, it might be worth uh, taking your idea of the uh, of the final column uh, into the discussion as as we go along. Uh, but I will hear from Mr. Pendlin and Mr. Richards. Uh, Mr. Fox, have you finished your hands still up? So that's okay. Thanks, uh, Mr. Pendle. Th thank you, Mom. Um, I won't reiterate what um, the, the points that others have just made, um, but you know certainly would endorse those. Um, it strikes me that um, each of the policies are very much of their time um, and use the terminology that's probably prevalent in, in, in the, the individual local plan examination cases. Um, something that, that strikes me is um, the difference between what a document is called and what it deals with and, and to what extent it deals with it. Um, so, for example, Memorandum of Understanding previously has dealt with um, the vehicle for potential agreement, officer member groups, not necessarily the, 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 extent, the extent or scope of evidential matters that might need to be dealt with. Um, and of course, e even that second part of that, you know, the evidence around what we're trying to achieve here is, is, a, is a further step removed from, from actual policy, where we might actually ultimately end up in terms of what we're actually trying to achieve in terms of spatial um, planning. So, so what the document's called is one matter, you know, but if it's dealing with process, policy or mechanism is, is another matter. Um, and for me, one, one of the things that, as I said, the individual trigger policies are very much of their time. And I think we can all recognise that. And we recognise that Harborough's trigger policy talks about the Leicester City plan because that was writ large during that examination process. Um, and indeed we are where we are now um, and, and you know, you heard me make comments about the existing trigger policy being um, being a product of the Northwest Leicester Local Plan as it was then. Um, so I think to try and sort of move us along, 
Ms Green's mentioned this final column. I, I think if, if we can focus on what it is that we're trying to wrestle with rather than what the document may or may not be called, um, that would probably be helpful. You know, what is the explicit matter that results in the need for action to be taken? Um, because of course, you know, I made the comment this morning, joint statements, statements of common ground, MOUs, you know, they are what they are. It's what they actually say and what they do that really matters. The sec second point I just briefly make, perhaps save me from coming back on in a moment, um, would be the trigger as written in the adopted local plan um, effectively hit the um, the alarm and set it at the point the inspector's report came out, gave that, that date for three months for the review, will commence, Mr Nelson's quite, you know, obviously correctly said, we've already commenced our review. Um, but, in, but in hitting the alarm or setting the alarm, it then set the end date for, for that to have happened. Um, so in other words, the alarm set, it's running, and we know when it's going to go off. And within that period of time, the, the type of matters that I've just been talking about, rather than the actual um, name of the document or, or you know, directing us towards somebody else's stuff, um, it was the actual content that Northwest Leicestershire were under pressure to try and influence in order to keep some life in their plan, not, notwithstanding comments we'll have later on deeming clauses, no doubt. Mm. Um, but it put the pressure on them to work with their partners to achieve that. What we've got now, of course, is, well, the, the clock has started on the local plan review, but potentially the alarm doesn't go off until such time as maybe or maybe not a statement of common ground is achieved, which maybe or may not deal with actual matters of numbers, spatial distribution, and responsibilities and roles for different local authorities. So, for example, if a statement of common ground is, is issued, which simply deals with a new mechanism and doesn't pick up on, in, on any of those things I've just mentioned, then it's arguable that the, the timescales for, for submitting the plan or completing it no longer relevant. So, so for me, it's content and um, and having, you know, with the best will in the world and, and as, you know, Mr. Nelson will know I've got a lot of sympathy with him because we've worked on local plans together before and had exactly this problem. The, 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 the individual partners in the HMA need the pressure to work together and it can't simply be left to um, a statement of common ground, which may or may not happen. And of course, the, the alarms only hit if it happens. You know, it yeah, has to be yeah. different to that. Yeah, I mean that that was uh, that was the point of my second bullet point on the agenda was was to what extent actually can uh, can the wider statement of common ground and its contents be influenced by by the partial review itself. Um, you know, I, I I'm not entirely convinced that um, it, it's for the the partial review itself to to set to set what the statement of common ground will be. I mean, obviously, uh, it's it's a discussion that will be had, but equally, uh, all the Leicestershire authorities aren't here at the moment, so they 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 won't be party to to this uh, discussion. I, I think we'll come back to that and certainly to um, to this hypothetical final column at the moment in the, that we we might have for the for the triggers statement of common ground. Uh, Mr Richards, you you wanted to say something. Yes, thank you, madam. <clears throat> it, it seems to me that, that there are three issues that we're going to be grappling with during this afternoon. The, the first is, should there be a trigger for submitting the local plan. And at the moment, the council is proceeding on the basis that there should be, uh, unless you tell us otherwise. Um, but everybody's noted that we're already embarked on the substantive local plan review. So it's not a trigger requiring us to commence a review. We're talking about a trigger to submit the local plan for examination. The second question then is, if there should be a trigger, what should that trigger be? And, and it seems to me that there are only two possibilities. One is a fixed date, the 25th of December 2022, for example, or a, a date relating unknown but relating to the time of or after a future event. That's the sort of trigger being proposed by the council and the future event is the agreement of a statement of common ground. Other people 
might say, no, 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 it ought to be a different event. Um, and if they think that, then um, we think that would be helpful if they identified the event they have in mind. And then lastly, which we'll come on to later, which we're not embarked on at the moment, the final question is, should there be any consequences spelt out in the policy in the event of a failure to meet the trigger? Should it be a deeming clause or some other consequence? Should there be any consequences spelt out? So it seems to me that those are the three things that we're wrestling with. Um, and at the moment, it appears that everybody thinks there should be a trigger, mm -hmm. but we're not all necessarily agreed on what that event should be. And then some people say there should be consequences and other people say there shouldn't, including the council spelt out. But we'll come back to the consequences debate later at the moment. We're focusing on the trigger. We think that the content, as Mr. Pendle correctly described it, is when everybody is agreed what the unmet need is and where it should be met. And the vehicle that we've identified for that is this statement of common ground. But if somebody thinks that it should be a different vehicle, then we're very willing to listen. OK, thank you. I mean, just just coming on to that that point, that's that's the first point, isn't it? That's made in this table in the comparisons um, about addressing uh, unmet needs either in Leicester City or elsewhere. Mr Nelson, wh what are your thoughts on that? I mean, obviously, Leicester City was referred to specifically because that was an issue at the time. Um, have things moved on in that respect, do you think? Um, well, not in the sense that uh, nobody else has declared an unmet need, but I do take Mr Fox's uh, point on board and I think there would be some merits in a, a slight rewording of that part of the policy to make it clear it isn't just Leicester City, it could be any of the authorities within the housing market area, particularly within the uh, context of uh, government's proposals for the standard methodology, which uh, who knows what that might mean for other authorities across Leicestershire. Um, some authorities who currently are, are, are uh, able to meet their own need, they may not be able to, possibly. We don't know. So I think it would allow for that possibility as well. OK, thank you. Uh, Mr Lees. Thank you, Madam. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering to what extent um, the precise wording is is um, is material to the actual situation of the council undertaking a review. Because again, I think what we're all what we're all trying to achieve is a mechanism whereby the council is going to undertake a comprehensive, the substantial review as um, as swiftly as possible. Um, so I, th I think that's where we're all trying to get to anyway. Um, the the um, I guess the question is, to what extent does any wording here um, uh, change um, the statutory requirement for reviewing uh, plans um, in any event? And obviously for those reviews to be completed no later than five years from the adoption of a plan as well. So so I guess it's just it's just understanding how quickly North West Leicestershire could in, 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 in any event having already started, as Mr Richard says, the process of the substantial review, not formally, we haven't had a Reg 18 um, consultation yet for the um, for the comprehensive review. Um, so, so, so it's just understanding how how the wording here is going to relate to other provisions, um, which is the statute provisions here and anything that might come out might come out in the in the white paper um, because I, I understand the predicament. Um, this review is needed um, within five years of the November 17 adoption of the existing local plan. And in terms of the changing circumstance, that changing circumstance is this unmet need that needs to be established. Um, so. I'm just thinking how, how quickly could that be done anyway, really? Uh, um, if we've got some comfort in terms of the timing of the statement of common ground, 
And if, as Mr. Fox says, you know, there is potentially a long stop date in there, that might give that might give some comfort. But uh, but uh, I, was, I was just thinking how much how critical is the wording here when you know they're going to get they're going to have to get cracking on it anyway. Yeah, I d yeah. I, Mr. Nelson, did you want to comment? Your hands raised. Yeah, it was just the um, uh, the comment from Mr. Lee's about uh, not not been any Reg 18 consultation on the substantive review. Obviously, we we did start the the substant what is will become the substantive review process in February uh, 18 as required by policy S1. We ended up in this situation where we then had to sort of diverge between the substantive review and the partial review. Uh, and, but certainly the consultation we've undertaken so far will it feed into uh, or is part of the substantive review. OK, thank you. Mr Richards. Uh, yes, just to, to make sure that we're not proceeding on a mis uh, under a misapprehension of, of the law. Uh, I, I share Mr um, Lisa's enthusiasm for getting on with it, but the requirement to conduct a review in the NPPF and in Regulation 10A um, is a requirement to um, conduct a review, not to complete review. So that the review there, PPG makes clear, is um, a, a review to decide whether your plan needs updating. So every five years, you have to decide whether the plan needs updating. This council's already done that and said, yes, it does. It needs a substantive review. Um, so that five year period mentioned in the NPPF is, is for that process. It's not five years between adopting one plan and adopting the next. Which is what we thought it would be when the idea was first floated. But in fact, the um, NPPF and the PPG and the regulations say something different. OK, thank you. Um, still got Mr. Nelson, and Mr. Pendles, uh, hands up. Did you want to say anything else again? Uh, yes, sorry. I just want to go back to what I what I said earlier on, and and probably uh, just to sort of correct something, I suppose. Uh, in policy S one, um, as it currently stands, um, it does actually refer to um, district council will work with the the other authorities to establish the scale and distribution of any additional provision that may be necessary in northwest leicestershire and elsewhere in the housing market area as a result of the inability of one or more authority to accommodate its own needs so i'm sort of going back again to mr fox's point so it does recognize that there there may be a need to accommodate um unmet needs from elsewhere than leicester but then the final part of that policy does just refer to uh, redistribution from uh, mm -hmm. from Leicester City. So whether that part needs looking at, but just just to be absolutely clear, the policy does do that anyway. Yeah, I, I think it would be uh, helpful for it to be consistent in that respect. So that that would be something that would need to be looked at, just so it's clear what the aim of the the policy is. Okay. Um, Mr. Richards was referring to um, what the trigger should be. Um, I, I think the majority of uh, uh, participants here seem to agree that the statement of common ground is the appropriate trigger. Is that is that correct? Is uh, or have I misread uh, anybody's comments? So I think that's right. It's just whether there is an additional backstop, I think, or other dates referred to. So um, uh, just coming on to the statement of common ground then. Um, yeah, I mean, there was a bit of a discussion about what, um, what the statement of common ground should include. Uh, I, again, I, I'm not entirely sure whether that that is something that this particular uh, examination can influence to any great extent. I, I would suggest that's a matter for for the authorities. I, I do know. Um, I think, Mr. Lees, you you suggested uh, some things that the statement of common ground could include, like commitments from each authority to meet its own housing needs, uh, cumulative figures. Is that correct? Is that what you were suggesting that? 
Yeah, it was just, uh, I guess I was looking for um, sort of an, an, really for the purposes of this examination, potentially having, um, because we've got the statement of common ground, which is in support of this examination, uh, November 2019. And then we've got this emerging statement of common ground between the authorities in terms of the redistribution. And clearly where I was really getting at for the purposes of for this examination, having a, a meaningful uh, um, and effective um, uh, uh, state of common ground uh, was, was, was to have m more detail as part of that same to common ground for this process. Clearly, we can't we can't uh, um, fill it in and uh, ascribe the numbers. Obviously, um, there is a significant process to go through for that, but it was just having a bit more detail um, about what that statement of common ground might be. And if that is an iteration, um, and if we're moving on away from a duty to cooperate point, obviously a statement of common ground is a is a living document. Um, you know, the extent to which, um, you know, that that is something that could move on, but I appreciate that, you know, trying to get all the authorities to sign it, if it's just for the purposes of this examination, whilst the main focus is on the meaningful statement of common ground, if I can put it like that, uh, um, uh, I understand the problems with that. So, so I think it's a bit much to ask for um, for that to happen in any reasonable time frame for the purposes of uh, um, this this examination. But um, yeah, some comfort, um, however it's presented as part of this examination, in terms of what that future statement of common ground will contain and time period within which it is likely what they're aiming towards. I appreciate there's politics, there's a huge amount of politics involved in agreeing to a redistribution of housing need as well as all the uh, sustainability appraisal work. So I appreciate it's a lot to be got, gone through, but if we can be given some some comfort as to um, what it's going to include and in time scales without it being a, a signed statement of common ground, that would be, I think, very helpful to give the participants to this examination and yourself, Madam, um, some comfort about putting in a long, potentially a long stop back date um, as part of the wording for this policy. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll come. Mr. Pendle, you've got your hand up still. Is that a, a new comment you want to make or is that? Um, it, it is, Mom. I mean, I, I hovered over reacting to your question about whether or not everyone was agreed that it would be a statement of common ground. And I, I don't want to be the Jonah here who says no. Um, but but my point about the content of it, you know, is, is is writ large in my mind. And certainly, you know, Mr. Lee's has just run through very deftly some of the reasons, you know, that I certainly agree with for that. Um, and, and I suppose it, it's trying to tread a fine line between what we may ordinarily expect of a local planet examination, obviously in this case, Northwest Leicestershire um, and, and Ian's sanity. Um, versus Power 11B of the MPPF and how we reconcile unmet needs from neighbouring authorities when we're testing a local plan soundness. Um, and clearly, you know, Mr. Inspector Sims went through that um, journey, went on that journey in very similar circumstances and arrived at a trigger. Um, and there was a backstop, you know, if, if I cut the story short, you know, I, I agree, Mr. S Mr. Lees is very, you know, carefully just said the comfort would come from the backstop. That's where Inspector Sims arrived at. And I think probably I, I, I would find support from others on the screen in the room. Um, if I said if it was left to a statement of common ground, which may or may not take place to work out what should happen with unmet need. You know, we already know there is unmet need. Um, and for that to then set the clock ticking, that would be not that would not be enough to encourage the partners to work together. OK, we'll, we'll come back on to what the, the backstop might be um, uh, just just shortly. But uh, Mr Nelson, you had your hand up and then, then I'd like to come to Mr Thornhill, I think, just to, to talk about the process that we're going through in terms of the statement of common ground. It may well be that I accidentally cover some of that, um, if I do apologies. Uh, yeah, it was just to make the point that um, paragraph 2.5 of the um, joint state position statement that was uh, published on on Monday is very clear there about um, 
what the unmet need is for both housing and employment. Um, and also it does give uh, some idea of, of, of what the timetable is for, uh, for, for getting that all agreed. So the sort of information that, that people have said is needed is, is now there in that joint position statement. Thank you. Um, and then in that case, uh, Mr Thornhill, does, does, does the, the joint position statement, does that provide the basis for uh, the statement of common ground? Will it flow from it? Will it say similar things or, or will it provide more detail? Have you got any idea of what the contents of the statement of common ground will be? Yeah, uh, the content will be quite simple. It's just getting the evidence uh, together to to support that. Uh, in, in my mind, it will be a simple table which will set out the uh, the, the housing targets for for each of the authorities, basically, with the unmet need redistributed as part of that. Um, we've mentioned, we've discussed about flexibility in that. So there's probably a discussion that we need to have internally amongst the authorities about how we can build in some flexibility to that if Leicester's unmet need uh, changes within a reasonable uh, range. You know, could, could, could we agree a range instead of a specific number? Um, we're not at the point where, where, where we've discussed that in any detail and know the answer to that. But obviously the duty to cooperate is ongoing anyway, so there's only a certain degree of flexibility. Um, you can build in um, and if things change dramatically then we'll obviously have to do um, a, a new statement of common ground that, that responds to that. So in my mind this is a, an ongoing never-ending process really. Um, we're at the start of it now um, or towards the start of it given the, the situation that we're in that we're, with the emerging situation as we've discussed. Um, but I think that you mentioned the backstop there. I think we just need to be careful um, if 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 Marm you're minded to go down that route, that we we don't assume um, that um, that Leicester will have an unmet need because we don't, what, what I don't want to do is start the clock like 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 we've got with uh, with the situation at the moment where it was assumed Leicester would have an unmet need and it will be dealt with in a in a specific time. We've discussed the emerging housing figures. Um, which the government's consulting on at the moment, not as part of the white paper, the, the changes to the current planning system consultation and the changes to the standard method there. If the government was to adopt that in two, three months time, there may not be an unmet need um, to deal with. So if we've got a, a trigger that's linked specifically to uh, Leicester's unmet need or the timing of Leicester's plan, then North West Leicestershire might find themselves in a similar situation where they've got a, a trigger that, that that set the clock running um, and they've got to submit a plan for an event that hasn't actually happened. So it, I'm not saying that a backstop isn't possible. We just need to be careful we don't repeat what happened um, last time, basically, with, with, uh, where, where we're prejudging what's going to happen when we don't actually know, if, if you see what I mean. It needs to be a more... Uh, a more general backstop, I, I would suggest, if you're minded to go down that route. OK, uh, and the the wider statement of common ground, that, that is intended at the moment just to deal with Leicester, assuming that there is a, an unmet need for Leicester, it's just going to deal with that and not any potential from any other authorities. So there might need to be other mechanisms to, to deal with that. Yeah, we, we've got a, a really a very complex situation here because we've got an authority, particularly Charmwood, looking to submit a plan uh, relatively early in 2021. So there are transitional arrangements at the moment in the in the current consultation um, to, to, to change the standard method, where if the government bring that standard method in, there's then three months to submit a plan. Um, and so Charmwood and possibly Leicester could quite easily but be submitting a plan in those transitional arrangements. So even if the new standard methods brought in um, in the next month or two, there's there's a strong possibility that that one or possibly two plans will be submitted under those transitional arrangements based on the current standard method. In that scenario, we end up in a sort of a parallel universe where we have an unmet need 
for Leicester that only exists for Charnwood's local plan and nobody else. <laughs> so, yeah. so you can see how it gets very, very complicated very yeah. quickly, um, as, depending on what the government do. Um, so there's a huge um, push to get this statement of common ground over the line, come what may, because it's, it's likely that at least one authority will be submitting a local plan based on these need figures that, that, that we know about at the moment and an unmet need in Leicester. But other authorities and the North West Leicestershire substantive review may well go through um, in a different situation. Um, their plan's likely to go to 2039, not 2036. And obviously we're dealing with a situation here up to 2036. Their current plan that we're, we're, that we're involved with here is to 2031. And Leicester's unmet need to 2031 is only around 1,800 homes, according to their trajectory published on Monday. So um, there's a whole set of complex um, scenarios that, that can emerge. Um, so I just think it's important, what, whatever we do with the trigger, um, and if there is a backstop, um, th that, it, that it's linked to um, events. I mean, in my mind, in my mind, the, the MPPF provides the solution anyway, in, in terms of it, it requires authorities to carry out a review um, and to, to establish whether they need to, whether their plan's out of date effectively and whether they need to update the plan. So I think I think the mechanisms in the MPPF, um, in, in my mind, as it is, um, whether whether we want to go further in terms of specific wording in the plan, um, is obviously a, not not a discussion for me. But um, but but that's a matter for her for yourself. Can I can I just say like, a couple of uh, participants have mentioned Charnwood. So Charnwood, uh, as far as I understand it, aren't intending to meet uh, any other need except their own. Is that correct at this stage? Uh, at this stage, their, 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 their plan hasn't been based on meeting uh, unmet need, um, but obviously that's, um, that's yet to be decided through this process. So, um, so it's not the process hasn't been been finished or completed, but I suppose they were in a similar situation to most authorities that have adopted plans um, over the last few years in that they've been progressing a plan, but we haven't had a quantified unmet need for Leicester. That's obviously recently come to the fore and that the consultation's happening at the moment. OK, thank you. I've got a number of people with their hands up, so I'll come to Mr Nelson first and then Mr Richards and then uh, others. Yeah, it's just to pick up on that, that, that point about Charnwood. Um, I don't think you'd be too surprised to hear that we uh, we, we did pick up uh, what they'd said in their local plan and expressed uh, our surprise, shall we say, that they were making what seemed to be a unilateral decision. But my understanding is it was uh, it wasn't intended to be them them to be saying that they are not going to take any unmet need from Leicester. It's just that at that point in time, they weren't required to because obviously, as we've said, that uh, that the, the level of unmet need and the discussions about how that was redistributed hadn't been uh, hadn't been undertaken. Okay, so that that might evolve then, um, yeah. depending on the signing of the statement to common ground or, or not or agreement. Uh, Mr. Richards. Yes, madam. Can I just? I just thought it might be helpful because I'm not clear what is meant by backstop when people on the screen are talking about that there needs to be a backstop. At the moment, there is um, the date of the statement of common ground, and then there is a, um, a, a requirement to submit within 18 months of that. Beyond that, is there any need for a further trigger, or is the reference to a backstop what I, what I call the consequences? I can understand that people on the screen are keen that the substantive review should progress, and if the council doesn't progress it sufficiently swiftly or with sufficient energy, then quite obviously um, what they want to achieve is the engagement of the tilted balance. Mm. That, that's, that, that's the practical outcome. Um, everybody is quite happy for an led system to work, but what they want is some comfort that if it doesn't work to their satisfaction, then the tilted balance will be engaged. 
But um, why do you need anything more than that which already exists in paragraph 11D of the framework? Yeah, I mean, I have to say I, my sense of what people were saying when they this talking about the backstop was uh, a number of people have, have referred again to, to the plan being out of date. Um, yeah, I mean, if, I, if you if, yes. if you have a deeming out of date provision, sorry, I was talking over you. If you have a deeming out of date provision, that takes us back to where we are now. Otherwise, paragraph 11D in the framework is is perfectly clear. If as a matter of planning judgment, a decision taker being be at the council's committee or an inspector on a section 78 appeal decides that the council has not been su uh, moving along sufficiently swiftly that decision taker can say as a matter of planning judgment i think this plans out of debt. sufficient progress and um, with its replacement is not being made and therefore i'm going to apply the tilted balance uh, and and no doubt um th that might be the subject of arguments against a known factual background in a future Section 78 appeal or planning committee meeting. But for you to try and predict that into the future is fraught with difficulty in a plan making context in my respectful submission. Thank you. Yeah, I did. That, that's what I was going to say anyway. I, I Yeah, uh, we, were, we were going to be back in the same position that we we are now. I think it, that's my sense, anyway, with the with uh, some of the suggestions about the plan being out of date. Uh, Mrs. French, sorry, you've been waiting patiently for a while. What what would you like to say? Hi, thank you, madam. Um, a couple of points, really. Um, I think I'm a simple planner, and I like to see things very simply. Ultimately, I think what we're trying to achieve is that the required number of houses within the housing market area are delivered in the most sustainable locations. Um, turning to Mr Richardson's, Mr. Richardson's point, um, I think the backstop will provide certainty so that everyone can understand what are the consequences if this happens or if that happens. And I think the way that these plans have evolved, the statement of common ground is a, is a good point of reference, but it might change, it might be something else. And having another reference would allow for that change to happen. So it wouldn't necessarily have to be the statement of common ground. It could be, you know, the um, the sustainability appraisal or, or something else that comes forward and provides the indication of where the houses are needed and when they need to be provided. So, so when you're referring to a backstop and when others are, what is it that is in your mind when you're saying back, what is a backstop for you? What does that mean? For me, what I would like and what I'd like to be able to tell my clients is um, is is when, when that plan or when those numbers are going to come out. Basically, that's, that's what I want to know. I think that it will provide um, some form of clarity for the whole of the Leicestershire area and um, and I think it will provide a, a focus of when that could happen. OK, and, and at the moment that seems to me that the statement of common ground is currently the only vehicle for for the numbers uh, and where they'll be distributed if if that is the case. I would agree at the moment I think that is the document that we're all looking at or looking for um but that might not be the case in the future okay thank you uh, mr lees thank you madam um yeah I, there's a couple of um, people have spoken since i put my hand up so there's a couple of um perhaps things i'd like to respond to in one go um I think firstly, from, 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 from Mr. Richard's point of view, uh, um, we haven't got a date for the statement of common ground. So the whole timing process of undertaking a review is, is a statement of common ground and there's no date for, for the signing of that uh, um, or the agreement of that, it's just that it will be agreed. And obviously it's pertinent, your, your next question, uh, I think 6B is what's the implications if the statement of common ground it isn't agreed. Um, Mr. Nelson alluded to uh, um, a few times about the plan-led system and the need for a plan-led system. Um, you know, we need to be planning for 
the housing requirements of the housing market area as a whole. So each plan needs to set a, a housing requirement figure that takes into account dealing with the housing needs of the HMA as a whole. That's what we all want to see. Um, and therefore, you know, any issue in terms of uh, um, looking at the, the relevance of, of, of policies in plans and so forth is it's all well and good if you're looking to make an appeal. But the bottom line is we want we want up to date plans that meet the housing need. Um, so it, it's all about getting plans in place for me that's meeting the housing need. Which brings me back to um, the, uh, the this this uh, statement of common ground, uh, um, and I was, I was interested to hear uh, Mr. Thornhill talking about that and Mr. Nelson. I was I was comforted by what Mr. Nelson said in an earlier session about it will have some flexibility in there um, in terms of potentially looking at a range, uh, um, and that the sustainability appraisal will test a range of figures. Because on the one hand, whilst we're keen to get this agreed. Uh, and so uh, um, each authority has a figure to work with. The nervousness is that obviously things things always change, and and how quickly is that figure then going to become out of date? So what I'd be interested uh, um, through yourself, madam, from uh, is is from Mr. Thornhill is, is 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 to understand the the potential for that statement of common ground to to deal with uh, potential different scenarios. Once we've got a figure, which is the base figure we can work on from Leicester City now, just over 7,000 houses, if we have a range uh, either side of that figure, which is agreed within the Statement of Common Ground, you know, that may, you know, lead to only us having one Statement of Common Ground and we haven't then go back and revisit that in six months time because it's because it's out of date. Um, so it's just understanding the the ability for that statement of common ground to include some flexibility to take account of potential future changes now as part of that one statement of common ground because trying to go and agree this politically and through a sustainability appraisal is very difficult again i don't envy mr thornhill's task in terms of trying to do that as well so if, if you can build that in and you can nail it with each of the authorities once um you know if it's this we'll accept this you know if it's a percentage or something then Clearly, that's going to help help everybody moving forward, and therefore, each plan process hasn't then got to be halted or wait pending the signing of a new sex um, statement to common ground. Everybody can crack on effectively, which will be a, a good place to be for everybody, I think, across.